Hey guys, it's Shane Simmons here. And over the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna release a few interviews that I did and probably over the course of three or four years. What I like about these is this is just raw and real. There's no preparation, had no idea what they were gonna be asked. They just asked questions and they answered in the moment. And I think that's really valuable, especially now that I'm watching them a year or two later. I think it's a really gather a lot of insight into what life was like growing up in these coal camps and these coal towns and it gives you a little bit more of an idea of, of what the real Appalachia is like. Uh, there's a popular series right now on YouTube that I won't dignify by calling its name out but it goes around and finds in most cases extreme people either in their looks or their whatever to try and draw attention and then you know I'm not saying that there's not uh, value in some of that possibly I guess I don't particularly enjoy it but uh, that's apparently some other people do but I thought it would be better to just get real people this is trying to find the most extreme of, because I could go to you know, New York City and interview 20 homeless people and come back and, and tell you that's what New York City is about is that fair no it's not is it accurate no it's not is it lying no those people really live there and that's really um, a part of their story but I think it's much more helpful and beneficial to see a more well-rounded picture of an area. So that's what I'm trying to do. This is a little bit of a counterpoint to that series, I guess. I think you really like Marion. I've got a few that are, I think you really get something out of and learn something that may bring back memories for some people, or if you're not from the area, it might give you a little bit more insight into what life was like growing up in coal country. So without further ado, I'll give you Mary Shandor. Thank you. First, uh, what is your name? My name is uh, Mary Shandor. Where were you born and raised at? I was born in Premier, West Virginia. My name was Mary Alice Martin before my marriage. What was uh, Premier like? Was it a coal camp? I lived in a coal camp uh, about two miles from the highway and um, in a wood frame home that was provided by the company and coal companies and then later we purchased it. Which coal company ran that uh, Royalty Smokeless or Pocahontas Coal Company. And you had some family that worked in the coal mines back then? Both of my grandfathers worked in the coal mines. Uh, two of my brothers, um, several of my uncles on both sides of the family worked in the coal mines. What did you think about that when you were younger? Were you scared for them to work in it? or? No, we uh, were so used to it that we just took it for granted that that's what they were supposed to do. And uh, when the larger mines would uh, lose coal demand for, uh, for purchasing, they would lay the men off and then some of the fathers and coal miners would uh, open up a small mines, which would be pretty close to the house and they would have to lay track and, and uh, work it on their own just to provide coal for the families. What was Premier like back then? Was it a pretty big bustling town or small? Or? It was um, bustling when it, back in the probably early 50s and then it started going down in the late 50s when uh, the demand for coal sort of went down and they closed a lot of the coal mines. I guess you had a lot of neighbors and uh, that type of thing move away, didn't you? Uh, no, most of them were older families and they stayed. But the younger families, like the children, uh, like myself, when uh, I graduated, I left for, and went to Washington, D.C. because I had a job waiting on me there, and there was nothing for the, the children as they grew up. Yeah. Was there a company store in Premier? We had a company store. Um, can't remember the name of it, but it was right there in Premier. Uh, they provided um, clothing, which was called the dry goods department. They had the groceries. And um, most of them, like in Colwood, had a gas station that you could purchase on credit. And like with my father, he was paid in script instead of money. Was that, uh, how did that work? It worked real well, except we had eight children. So by the time his payday came, it was, uh, most of his script was gone <laughs> by charging. Yeah. What did he think of the coal companies? Did he, did he think they were treating them pretty well? Or? Well, he never complained. I think he just took it in stride that he had to work and provide for his family. Was uh, he ever laid off or any of that kind of stuff? Oh, yes. He'd be laid off and, 
at that time, um, they didn't have welfare to sort of subsidize. Um, they would have provide like um, powdered milk, um, the dried eggs, um, things like that for the children in school. Or the unions would give you canned stuff, that like beef and uh, there'd be some meat in the beef, cans of beef and stuff. But it wasn't like it is today. Pretty big family. We had eight children. I'm the oldest of the eight. And then I have a half sister by my dad's second wife. So there actually there's nine of us, but at the time in Premier, there was eight in our family. So you had a lot of responsibility as the oldest one then, didn't you? Right. Yeah, I helped with the children. If they got sick, I stayed in the hospital with them. Uh, mainly, Mom always had a smaller one that she had to be home with. Um, it was kind of hard uh, making my grades, and um, it was more like I was a second mother, you know. What were Christmases like when you were a child? Uh, Christmas was totally different than what we have today um, in our family. Like I said, my dad would have to be paid by script, so he would get our presents at the company store. And if they didn't work, we didn't get anything. But we would go out and cut a tree and hang uh, Christmas cards on it, or popcorn, stuff like that. When you look back on your childhood, was that a happy time in your life? Yeah, uh, it wasn't the material things, but we all had it rough, so we had each other and we clung together. So as I look back, I have lost a brother and a sister, and I wouldn't trade the memories that I had with them for nothing. What was the town like back then? Was there a lot of different races and uh, ethnicities? And Not in uh, Premier as much. Uh, other communities, I've seen a lot of different um, race, uh, nationalities. But um, in Premier, it was more like one big family. All the neighbors looked after each other because everyone had it rough. So when one didn't have something or something happened in the family, everybody would help. What was school like back then? School, um, we had dedicated teachers. And I think they really made a change in your life. They sort of encouraged you to be more and they would work with you real, you know, a lot. Um, I can still remember my, one of my teachers in the second grade, just because the way she would uh, read stories to us and things like that, that meant a lot because my family didn't have time for that. And with the teachers, was that a public school or was it, there, there was that done by the coal company too? It was um, a public school, premier school, elementary. Then once I got out of, the, out of the elementary, I went to Welch High School. What was the uh, hardest thing about growing up in the coal fields? Uh, the hardest thing was um, having to walk to school, to catch the bus, to go to school. We'd have a long walk and the roads would be so muddy. And uh, we had a railroad track which had a trestle. So when the roads would have real deep ruts and from the coal trucks. So we would walk the tracks and then you'd have to run across a trestle to be sure a train wasn't going to get you before you got across, <laughs> just to stay out of the mud. And uh, it was a lot different. I, I learned to take, have two pairs of shoes. I'd leave one at the mouth of the hollow so that I could switch out and be clean when I got on the bus. <laughs> so um, you learn to take care of yourself. You form independence and um, uh, just you want to set goals for your life to live better. Do you remember any accidents or explosions or anything that happened? Or was there anything like that that went on? Um, not really in Premier. Um, in later years, I, I can remember a lot of that. But I can remember my dad, you know, getting his knees hurt. It'd swell up from working on his knees and things like that and have to go get the water drained off his knees. And, uh, other than that, we were really fortunate. Neither one of them ever got hurt really bad. Did you ever go back home to that area and visit? Oh, yes. What's it like now? Okay. It's totally different. The um, company 
homes are basically gone. There might be one or two left. Uh, it's been replaced with modulars and uh, trailers and new homes built. What do you think will happen to a lot of these coal towns in the next 50 years? I think that um, basically the ones like that I'm from will more or less go away. It's going to be more replaced with more modern facilities and and uh, homes. Do you remember anything like well, when John F. Kennedy came or any of that stuff? Or? Yeah, when John F. Kennedy, <clears throat> the day he was shot, I was in uh, Maryland and I was um, ready to have my first child and I can remember it's near Thanksgiving time and we just went into a shock. Just couldn't believe that that was happening. He spent a lot of uh, time in West Virginia. I know he was he spoke at Welch and that kind of stuff. I mean, he's kind of a well thought of here. Yeah. Yeah, no one's ever forgotten JFK. I still, I think we all love him. What, uh, when you look back on the coal industry, do you have a positive, or do you think it's been a good thing or a bad thing for the area? Well, I think it, uh, without the EPA standards, we could have a more thriving uh, con uh, counties and uh, state, really because it sort of took away a lot of employment for the coal companies and the miners. I don't think a lot of people understand that either. You know, you hear about the environment and that type of thing, but you know, despite that, I feel like, it, like I've said before, if coal was up for an election, it would win in a landslide. It would. Why do you think that, I mean, there's so many injuries, there have been so many, there's environment and all this stuff, but it's still very popular, is it not? It is uh, because it pays well now. It pays probably five times, ten times maybe more than what it did when my father was working. And uh, in later years, I have a younger brother that was working. And I think the last few years he worked, he made like 97000 a year. So that's good money. Yeah, I mean, that's... Basis, you know, what my dad just barely made it was script. So, you know, it's came a long ways. And they have more safety standards. Um, they have stricter rules for them to follow when they work in the mines. So um, with the EPA, I'm sure it has some good things, but it's really put too many restrictions on the coal miners, in my opinion. Anything else, any other memories you have from growing up? And uh, I can remember the fun we used to have with Play Till Dark and, and the games. We didn't have a lot of toys, things like that. And we didn't uh, go a lot of places, just a church or to uh, a dance once in a while. And so basically school was a getaway for me. You know, I enjoyed school because at home I was taking care of children and it was more freedom for me. But uh, I can remember playing outside. Uh, we had one called Red Light, Green Light, Tin Can Alley and all that. And that's games you don't even hear them playing anymore, you know. So, yeah, I can remember a lot of good times we had, just like we'd play at the Tipple, where we knew we weren't supposed to be, and even started up sometimes after the miners left, which we get a good one for that, but, <laughs> but I had a lot of fun, yeah, helping my dad. Uh, they had a, a wagon mines, and they were laying uh, rail to pull the coal, coal cars out and they would hook it to a mule and bring it out. And a lot of times we'd have to take their lunch to them, and uh, he, he and his brother. And uh, when they would get the car out there, they would flip it up and let it go down in a chute, which is over a bank embankment. And he'd say, you girls get in there and jump up and down in that slack and make it go down so when the trucks get under it, you know, we can pull the lever and it'll just fill the truck and we don't have to get down and do it by hand. So we'd have a ball just running and jumping in that coal and slack. We'd sink up to our knees. And that was really fun, even though it was actually work. We thought it was fun. Do you remember uh, any family members were coming home to, after working in the mines, what, what they looked like? Or... Yeah, my dad would come home and he'd uh, be starved to death and he'd wash his hands up so far on his arms and wash his face. And he'd, he'd be black everywhere else except there. And he'd sit there and eat a bowl of beans and, and uh, potatoes and stuff and have the best meal ever was, just black as a little coal miner. <laughs> what about uh, dating? What did young people do for dating? Um, 
Well, some parents were more strict then, so the boys would have to come to the house, and it would be scrutinized by my dad, and we weren't allowed to go anywhere. If we did go, like, to the drive-in to get something to eat, he'd say, you better be back before dark. And one time, it was only a half hour to dark, so <laughs> we had to go and come right back. And I was about uh, 17 at that time. And he would say, um, you don't do what I do, you do as I say, girl. That was his motto. So that's the way I was raised. Well, it's pretty strict, but... He was, but we'd get out and play horseshoes, and he was just like another big kid, you know. So we, we had uh, a lot of good times. Like some, in some cases, he would, uh, one of the games he'd play with us was he'd draw a line and we'd pitch pennies to see who would win, just put them on the line, you know. And we'd go swimming, he'd bank up the creek and, uh, kept, you know, let the water fill up and then we'd all go swimming. And we did a lot of things family, that families don't do now, you know. What would your mom do while you were working? What did your mom do? My mother basically uh, kept the house, work done. She um, cooked and took care of us kids. That was basically what she did. And once a week, they'd go to the grocery store and uh, we'd get cookies once a week. Unless she baked donuts or something like it at home. I bet she still worries about you, doesn't she? Yeah. Yeah, 92 years old, um, she told me just a few days ago, she broke her hip and her leg and she's in the nursing home and she said, I have to get well, I can't leave y'all. I've got to take care of y'all. <laughs> so we're taking care of her, but she's going to take care of us. <laughs> and basically she is, she's our, our rock, you know. She's taught us a lot and um, some of the memories that she has of the depression and how they made it through and the hard times she had growing up during that time. And there was five children, and I see, yeah, five of them in that family. When you look back, what are the happiest memories of your life? Like 4th of July, we would go to my grandmother's on my mother's side and they would have the um, dry crocs that they put ice cream in, dry ice, you know what I'm talking about? I don't know if they do it now or not, but it'd be full of ice cream and watermelon, and we'd be up in a holler in Big Jenny on her farm, and um, we'd have a big outing for everybody, all the cousins, and a lot of my cousins are just like brothers and sisters. My mother married, um, my mother's sister married my dad's brother, so we have a lot of double first cousins, and we grew up real close to it. So all together, there was seven double first cousins, plus my mom's eight, and my dad's daughter is nine. So it's uh, 16 children there. Then my, my Aunt Ruth had uh, 11. So all those boys and girls and the daughters would come to our house. So we always had a house full. And we'd play cards and be up half the night just playing cards. We made our own good times, you know. And music, we'd have a, we had an old round radio. I don't know if you've ever seen them. They're made round it. I thought it said Cosby on it, but it was an old round one. And in the mornings, we'd get, be getting ready for school. And one morning, I was flat footing in the kitchen. <laughs> and that radio came off that refrigerator and busted. I got a good whipping for that. <laughs> it's the only one we had. We didn't have a TV till I was 15. And we had a number two tub. We didn't have a bathroom, you know, until I was about 15. So all of us would take a bath in that big bath uh, tub. And one morning, my brother, I always made sure I was the first one in that tub. <laughs> and they had to heat the water on the kitchen stove, you know, then add cold water from the sink. And uh, one morning, my brother was taking, going to take a bath, and I watched him. He was taking the towels and putting them all around the chairs so no one could see him. And I hid. I waited till he got in that tub, and I jerked every towel up, and I was hollering, ha, 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 I see you. <laughs> he really got mad. <laughs> but we'd do little things like that to each other, you know. 
and uh, it was just a lot of fun and uh, as far as the uh, bathroom we got that when I was 15 and uh, we had an outside toilet till then and boy you made sure you went out there and got home got back in real quick especially in the winter it was cold <laughs> so uh, we had a lot of good memories just family fun you know and family hard times Put together there, didn't we? Yeah, we had a a kitchen stove, one of the old timey ones, and it had a water heater on the back of it, where you could the cup, fire would keep it hot. Then in the living room, we had a hearth, where you'd just put the coal on and you'd stand bake the back of you, then turn around and bake the front. Never got it warm enough because those houses just weren't that made that well, you know, or insulated. But sometimes I wouldn't trade those memories for nothing. You know, I couldn't wait to get away. And then once I got away, I've learned it's not uh, the material things or better homes and all that that makes a family. It's the love you have in that family and the love you share. Why do you think people stay here now? It, it, it has died off a little bit mining-wise and that type of thing. Well, they have a uh, little more job opportunities now, you know, and a lot of these people like here in Bramwell, um, they, they work away and a lot of them is retired. And I think it's the same way with uh, like Premier. Most of those people are retired or um, disabled, you know, nothing better to go to really. And family, most of the family stay together. That's all I've got. Unless you got anything else you'd like to say? No, I just shared a few of our memories and I hope they help. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank y'all. I'm going to put you from the thing. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm going to take it with me, honey. That's <laughs> oh, that great. Yeah.